Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Juma this morning. A r- rather grey day. We don't have much of a sunrise today because it's uh, it's pretty overcast. And instead of coming this way, it looks like this cloud is moving in the opposite direction. As you can see in the horizon, to the southwest of us, very, very low cloud, very dark, very ominous. And I hope that we're not going to get, not for a couple of hours at least, we're not going to get rained on. It can rain between drives as much as it wants. My name is Mark. Andrew's with me on camera today. Brian is back in FC and we had late arrivals last night. Scotty's back and Alex is back as well. Time to get things stirred up a little bit here at Juma Game as well. Try and get two vehicles out as soon as we can. Well, we're coming down to Filament's Dip. We're going to do some loops around Treehouse and Zoe's Road, Rebecca's Road. See what we can find in the way of tracks. Been a lot of elephant around. <coughs> Pulled up a pipe from this is the pump house, by the way. This little cut that we see coming through Filament's Dip is actually where there is a borehole or a well, as it were. Pump that pumps water to the camp, and well, elephants have pulled up all the pipes, not all, some of. So we might have a water problem later today. Not the end of the world. Somebody, I'm sure, will get to fix that. Well, elephant were around. I think probably the same areas we were watching here late yesterday. Might have gone up towards Gary Dam. We're going to try and get there at some point. Overcast day, not really a day for visiting water holes. interesting question from Lisa. Thanks Lisa. If an animal was bitten by a snake and a predator ate it, what would happen? Well the venom, actually most venom, whether it's a bee sting or a snake bite or a scorpion sting, most venom is protein, a type of protein. So swallowing it doesn't really do any damage. You could swallow venom. There's a nyala bull. Two nyala bulls. <coughs> the, of course, it doesn't. It wouldn't really have a secondary effect once it is once it enters the the body of an animal and and enters the bloodstream of an animal. It'll eventually break down by the time a predator eats it anyway. But uh, funny enough, I had a friend, although it's safe to swallow venom, I had a friend who had some sores, some abscesses, 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 had some sores in his mouth. And when he got bitten by a snake, he tried to suck the venom out of the bite. And unfortunately, 
the venom entered his bloodstream through these sores in his mouth and it proved fatal for him. So as long as it can't enter the bloodstream, you can swallow a protein, you can swallow venom quite safely. Three Nyala bulls. Be nice to one day see them squaring off against each other. But uh, they have what we call a dorsal crest, they've, they've like a mane that that run, runs all the way down their back, that white hair along their back, and they have an ability to raise that hair along the ridge of their back, their dorsal crest. And very impressive. Maybe we can see these two boys pushing at each other. <coughs> we might just see them. We might just see them do that. No. This is all displacement activity, the kind of what looks like grooming. They want to square off against each other, but both are showing a little bit of restraint. So they engage in displacement behavior, a bit of grooming, a bit of scratching, a bit of... displaying. sides of the road. Andrew's got to swing around from one side to the other.
<coughs> Morning, Lisa. Lisa asking quite a. Brian sort of tried to give me a synopsis, uh, a breakdown of what Lisa is asking. Quite a long question, I think, um, about bomas, about keeping livestock in enclosures at night and lion breaking in. Doesn't really happen much in South Africa. Um, the Maasai and up in East Africa, where there are, hang on, Sorry. catching up on the radio. Botswana, I think, maybe, but up in Kenya, Tanzania, it's more there where you have people still living in well, wildlife and people living in the same areas, especially in Maasai land. And the thorn bomas that they build to keep their livestock safe from lion. Bomas, and it's, it's basically just an enclosure. It can be very heavy tree trunks here and Although we don't really have much of a predator problem, people still do put their cattle away in pens. I guess it's a, you could call it a very small paddock, is what it is. But it, it has to have a fence, or it has to have a, a, a wall around it, either made out of thorn bushes or redwood stumps, big heavy tree stumps, anything that keeps it livestock safe and predators out and every now and then predators get into it get into a boma and kill animals I'm not too sure what the question is that Lisa's asking though okay let's continue leave these three boys to their own devices mind the cats later boys Oh, that's what we were going to do. We're going to go and look for that piece of bone that the kudu was eating. That's another thing we must do later today when we get back up to quarantine. Oh, <coughs> uh, because I took the steering wheel off yesterday. That's why I put it on the wrong way. There you go. No, I can just turn it around. If I could just find the, the tool. Yeah, and I'm just going to turn it over the way it was. Bill. Morning to Bill in Michigan. I'm trying to read some tracks. Bill's asking since we go live at six o'clock in the morning, what time do we get up? And what time do we go to bed? A little bit personal, but I don't mind answering that. But not really. Personally, I can only speak for myself. Personally, I. Well, I, my alarm goes off at five. And we'll pull the vehicle out of the carport and around uh, anywhere from between 5.30 and 20 to 6. To load the camera, check the fluids. Wendy is quite thirsty, so she's got to have water before she goes on drive every day, every drive. And 
today we were like today we we, we left 10 minutes before six so i did a little bit of a drive around quarantine first Sometimes we leave almost two minutes with two minutes to go. Sometimes there might be a snag. We try, we try, and we we pretty much ready ten minutes before. But sometimes we hit the snag or something can delay us. Like system crashes and um, the feed from the vehicle. <clears throat> Morning, how South Dakota? <coughs> I wants to know if I think that. And now if I whether I think Mvula would be able to carry one of those Nyala bulls up a tree. I think so. I've seen I have a leopard at home, a big male. That's I don't he's not quite as big as Mvula, I don't think. I've seen him with a Nyala bull up a tree. And I've seen Yambilu Yodan, who is Mvula's predecessor, as the, the father of Karula's first two sets of cubs. Three sets of cubs. Seen him up the tree with Anyala. I think Mvula would be able to handle that. What's with that noise? Uh, Drongo. Sounded like the yelp of a dog. A wild dog. They have very high pitched yelps. Got a bit of a frog to that. I don't know if Karula would have the strength. I don't think she's big enough for a big Nyala bull. But she's proven to be capable of taking big impala rams. Taking them down and while feeding on them on the ground. Oh, very quiet treehouse dam compared to yesterday with buffalo and elephant and leopard. Marco in New Jersey, how long would it take for an adult giraffe to be subdued by a snake bite? Well that just opens it up to a depends Marco. That depends on the snake bites. Person from Texas, I think, MF Jim. 
which antelope is the most difficult to bring down for a predator depends which predator we'll go through them first just want to get back to the giraffe question i suppose with them i don't know i guess black mamba being the most powerful of venoms that a giraffe is likely to succumb to maybe a cobra neurotoxic venoms i really don't know the answer to that i couldn't tell i have no idea it depends on how much venom is injected i suppose to some extent The thing is that if a giraffe is bitten by a snake, can it is found, if it, and, and it's especially a neurotoxic venom, it affects the n nervous system, the, uh, it's going to go the other way. Not much, not much in the way of tracks down here. And somebody said something about him, some impala running up on a pile of planes. Be better to head that direction. What is this? I can't remember what this road is called. I've never, I've only ever called it Tree House Dam Road. That's all it really is. Yeah, road. Yeah, road south. Um, a giraffe on the ground is a little bit, or uh, it's a little bit at a disadvantage. Um, and if its head was to be level with its body, if it was to be lying flat, it probably would dive. Um, I don't know, other things before it died of the venom maybe. Giraffe flat on the ground can die relatively uh, quickly. As far as I'm aware. I mean, when, once lion get giraffe down, they can they can get it down, they can pretty much kill it. Antelope is the most difficult for a predator to to bring down. Um, we have a bit of a time delay between FC and I, so bear with us with questions this morning. Um, if we start from the beginning, the biggest predator, the lion, the antelope most difficult for lion to bring down? None really. I think if we had to think of one-on-one, -on -one, maybe uh, even then, I've seen lion bring down wildebeest. Kind of a difficult question because once again it depends on so many things. I suppose the question is more general and even a generalized question. Sable is supposedly, big male sable are supposedly difficult um, for lion. Leopard, anything out of their size range, so anything that's sort of above them, Yala would be a little bit big for a leopard. Cheetah. Obviously size be becomes an issue and, and anything bigger than maybe a wildebeest and even then wildebeest can be quite big for cheetah they have to invariably for, for, for wildebeest cheetah would have to hunt as in a coalition or hunt as a, as a, as a group which can and does happen with brothers.
recording Larry in Orlando. Not sure if I covered that one about the yeah. antelope. But it's uh, sometimes different days. The antelope that might prove difficult one day might prove easier another day. Different individuals. It's not an easy question to answer that one about which antelope is the most difficult. I'll think of it. I'll think on that one. I'll, I'll try and work, work it out in my head. Um, Larry wanted to know if leopard eat part of the carcass to lighten the load to take the carcass up the tree. What they are notorious for doing, if they have the chance, is, is disemboweling the prey um, and burying the contents, the stomach contents. That tends to lighten the load a little bit. The thing is, Larry, it's difficult sometimes for them to do that because there are times when as they kill something, you know, just the noise of, of the alarm calls and maybe the noise of the animal dying is enough to bring other predators running because everything knows the sound of alarming and the sound of dying creatures. And so hyena, lion, maybe even other leopard are likely to come along. And steal their prey. So sometimes I've seen leopard in the past. I've been with leopard on the leopard kills when they've taken down an impala and they st the impala still kicking, they're still throttling it, they're still strangling it. And got it by the throat and a hyena are there almost immediately because the hyena had been, had been close by. And leopard shooting up a tree with an impala still kicking, no time to do anything. But we also noticed here quite a lot and I've seen it at home as well in Timbavati when leopard during the day sometimes during the day it's the least likely time when they're going to be when they're going to be disturbed by any other predator and they don't even take their prey up a tree they just eat it on the ground there's no threat so yes I guess final answer to that question is that yeah sometimes they do have partial have part of the carcass or they do lighten the load of the carcass to get it up a tree not always it's not one of those things with, with, with leopards it's one of those things that every time it can be different circumstances are different the size of the animal the competition from other predators Anything besides marula that is harvested to make liquor? Um, nothing I know of. Sarah, that's Sarah in California. Morning, Sarah. What did I know of? Uh, other than, of course, the the usual fruits in, in in the agricultural sector, where we we do have a large fruit growing community in this country, fruit farms. Obviously the climate dictates which type of fruits. Here in Hoodsprate, it's very much a mango part of the world. Um, but down in the Cape where the apples and the pears are, oh, the oranges here too, a lot of citrus here as well as mango. Um, but no, indigenous fruits, no. Only the marula really. Well, they're not really harvested that much in the wild. I mean, locals, local people do harvest marulas for marula beer, but there are enough marula trees outside the reserve that nobody needs to really harvest them inside the reserve. In any case, they belong to the elephants and the kudu and the baboons.
the fruits, I mean, and the trees in the reserve. Shedded skin from a snake. Obviously, he used those thorns to pull it off like the stocking. Looks like the head's further down the little twig, down the branch. Where the, the skin started to be peeled off. Clancy, morning Clancy. Was Clancy's question? I forgot. Fine. Help. 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 <coughs> Clancy's question if you can find it please. Sharon wanted to know uh, do animals give birth during dry season right that's what it was. Some animals do Clancy there's some animals that don't have specific seasons. Um, dogs tend to give pup have pups in dry season. Half. My, my brain is not going to do this well, I'm not going to do me proud this morning. Sharon was asking <sighs> Hyena Mom, does Hyena Mom, do they share responsibilities? Uh, does a, a babysitter stay behind while Mom goes and hunts? Yes, very much Sharon. Normally find the younger, a younger individual staying at the den when the adults are all out hunting or scavenging.
Yeah. Nice to see that dark cloud hanging around in there. Morning Marianne in Boston. And Marianne think was asking if I think that was maybe a vine snake skin. And Mary Marianne has heard that they're very venomous. Quite so Marianne. One of the most venomous. Up there on the left. Oh yeah, and it's still it's a bark spider that and she's still alive the dragonfly. But tiring slowly. And this is wind movement. I'm going to bark spider. If we if we just go back a little bit as we I don't know if we're going to try and get it, but it's getting quite vigorous. Two trees that are easily 15, maybe 20 feet apart. And this web, the bulk of this web is easily 12 feet high. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry, that was almost at the microphone. Okay, I'm going to stand up and the spider's not going to come for it now. hoping it would, would be able to show you. Bing. Quite incredible. Quite strong silk. Not as strong as golden orb. In fact, if we had to come past here this evening, we'd probably find her building a new web this is for, for tonight's catch. Well, dragonfly lives another day. Bird could have taken it. Dragonflies are interesting because of the, uh, I just say such ancient creatures. Historically, in, in, in fossil records, there were dragonflies with six-foot wing, six wingspan. 
million litres of years ago. Oh, hang on, before I... They're talking and take all morning to wait for these guys to finish conversations. We need to talk on the radio. Um, dragonflies, yes. Extremely fast flying animals. And um, insects that are able to feed on the wing. They hunt on the wing and they feed on the wing. And there goes a European roller. Another one. Being chased. Their legs are, are shaped in such a way that they can actually, or rather, as they catch things, their legs automatically hold the prey at their mouth. So they don't have to catch things and then physically move parts of their body so that they can feed. As they catch things, the food is right there at their mouth and they can fly and function. Um, without having to stop. Hello, wildebeest. Wild beast. I'm just going to check on Gary Main quickly. We'll come back to these wildebeest. See what tracks they are. Yeah. yeah. Still haven't found any sign of Karula. Aha, there's Lifford. Hey Rita. In Joburg. I've noticed there aren't any crocodiles in any of the dams. Like it could have been a bullish track heading down south. We want you to know why there aren't any crocodiles or are there any crocodiles? Notice that they, we haven't seen any crocs in any of the dams. How come or are there? Sometimes, Rita, when we've had very heavy rains, and the riverbeds flow. But there are crocodiles in some of the bigger dams on other properties. But... Not here on Juma. There has been in the past. And... Uh, that Mulwati River, where Gauri Dam is, Gauri Dam and Twin Dam are in the same dry riverbed system. And between the two of them, they, there has been or have been crocodiles visiting when those rivers flow after severe flooding but not this season we haven't had uh, haven't had heavy enough rain to get the Mawati flowing nicely to get the catfish moving up the rivers no leopard tracks here Coming this way. This leopard was coming from the Rebecca's and he must have come out here somewhere. There he goes. Come out here.
Uh, morning stations, Mark here. Uh, there was someone yawning east of Treehouse on Treehouse Road and corns off for my daughter Ingwe coming on to Gowrie, Main from Rebecca's. Not working now. Andrew, do you copy? The repeater's not working. Not working. Very well. So, Vula might have been came down this way. Or it could have been what was his name? That other big male from down from this area. Morning, Joan in Michigan. Have we ever encountered any parasitic wasps? And do we have any carnivorous plants? Yes, Joan, morning to you. Yes and yes. The parasitic wasps, well, we actually get more than just parasitic, we get parasitic wasps. Excuse me, looking at the ground, and I'm trying to find tracks of this leopard. Um, we have parasitic wasps and super parasitic wasps. We'll talk about wasps uh, in a bit. Carnivorous plants in South Africa, we do, we get just the sundew plant in the Cape. It has sticky tendrils that insects stick to and it feeds on them. Like it came this way at all. Let's try Arethusa and see if he maybe went somewhere down this way up towards the airstrip, maybe. The problem with viewing wasps are that they move very, very fast. With a fixed camera on the vehicle, it's very difficult to get to see. Or, or, or to zoom in on a very, on especially some of the, the smaller parasitic wasps would be almost impossible. And maybe the only time we can really get to see them is if I find dead individuals or if we have one on a little leaf that is a sort of eye level that we can get close enough to. And I'll certainly try because they are very interesting creatures, very interesting lifestyle, or rather life, uh, lifestyle, but life cycle. Didn't come this way, but maybe we'll find 
Palms is where he did go. And of course, the super parasitic wasp is so tiny, you have to have it uh, one millimeter long, you have to have it on the dashboard. But any signs that I find of parasitic wasps will certainly show you, tell you about them if I can. on the ground with elephant tracks. We have been elephant here. Alaska from a special part of the world. Morning Heather, nice to hear from you. Asking about bark spiders, they look pretty big. They are, the, the large bark spiders that can spin webs between two trees 20 feet apart, 10 feet in the air. They are fairly large spiders, they can be about two, two inches maybe in diameter. And as the name suggests, they look very much like the bark that they sit on during the day. So if I found another bark spider, see that was too high and too far apart. But if I find the remnants of another bark spider, especially since we had the right conditions yesterday, lovely hot, humid conditions, which are favorable for insects, flying around which means that if there are insects flying around then they've got to be spiders out to catch them and quite possible that there might still be the odd bark spider web. Ordinarily they break the web down in the morning and they normally reel in most of the silk and all the insects that they might have caught like a fishing line. Morning Kingfisher. You see a mouth, good morning. <laughs> what did you catch? Dived into the grass at the bottom of this marula tree and off he goes. I think he missed. But if you follow the main strand, the main horizontal strand on the bark spider's web, you might be lucky enough to find the spider itself. And it's almost impossible to notice it sitting on a branch because it looks exactly like the bark. Some of the bark spiders have these ornate sort of horn shaped things that look like thorns. Extremely well camouflaged during the day. Hey Mr. Kudu. Where are you running to? Gwendolyn! Morning Gwendolyn! Here comes another big bull. Oh, he's running away. These are not our bulls because these are shy bulls. But this is Arethusa, by the way. I'm going to see a third kudu bull further up ahead. Let's see, because that one's hiding behind the quarry. Let's see if we can catch up with this third monster. He's not such a big one. Gwendolyn wants to know about the red and black butterfly. Uh, well, I didn't get to it yesterday, Gwendolyn, but I can play with my book now while we, maybe while we stop and look at a good red and black, that particular red and black, many other red and blacks.
Acrias, Wellington Acria, let me go forward. Hiding, we carry on. Little leopard, little leopard. This one might be a spot where some tracks might be picked up. Commodores. No, nothing here. Well, since we came this way, let's go and have a look at the airstrip. But no, not an orange banded protea. You see, this one had didn't have very symmetrical markings coming up the wing. These are all the small little blues and all these small butterflies. There, that's that's who it is. Common scarlet, axiosoces. Chihuahua, Chihuahua, definitely that one. Rapid darting flight, male often at hilltops, bare twigs. Blah, de blah, de blah. That is what it is. Common scarlet. Now I know. Now we all know. Thanks, Genevieve. Here we go. Common scarlet. New butterfly for me. I'll read up more about it. Axiosurces. The nuts are there, gosh. Apart from the marula. Theodora, morning to you, Theodora. What other kind of nuts are there? Well, I suppose if we can classify a nut as the dicotyledon of a, the, the, the seed. And what is, what, I suppose. Marulas are pretty much it. And there are seeds inside nuts, inside, well, I don't know what defines a nut, an end. 
I'm not. Where do you? Where does the line get drawn? Where does the between? Uh, if I was to take a buffalo thorn seed, which is a nut, which is a kind of like a nut, it's like a stone rather. And if I were to break it open, which is not very easy because they're extremely hard, same as like a raisin bush, very difficult to get into. But if I was to take the seed out of that stone, could we call it a nut? Even if it's a tiny little flat seed, would it be called a seed or would it be called a nut? That is the question. To be a nut, to be... <laughs> think what else that what else would be called a nut I suppose also like the Balanites fruit got stone around all around the seed inside and you have to break it open to get it is that what the nut is is a brown snake eagle snake eagles unless they're standing together a lot of eagles can be quite difficult to tell the difference between male and female but today of course it's different because they have dimorphism or dim sexual dimorphism in bachelor snake eagles but not in a brown snake eagle most Eagles, the female is larger than the male, so it's easier to tell when they are together. Oh, uh, let's drop it. <laughs> like a blankie, your pillow. Hmm? Is it like a blankie? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine it must be... I haven't sat in the back of the vehicle on that side of things for a long time. But I imagine it must get quite hard on the back. Somebody asked me about jumping spiders and how to, what a jumping spider nest or web looks like. Here we go. A while ago. Yeah, on this leaf. I don't know if she'll be in there. It looks like it's been used. Looks like it's no longer in use. being used by an ant. Can you see it there? I mean, can you see into it? There you go. Come on out, come on out. There's a baby marula tree. I've got a marula tree at home that's that size and it's probably more than 12 years old. It just never gets any bigger. Oh, there's another... There's another jumping spider nest. That one's being used. See, that one has been torn open. My guess is that either a wasp or something got in there to, to, to damage that spider. If we look at this one, 
if it's not, is it not too close to the car? It's okay. Okay, let me go and have a look at this one. She's in there. The, the entrance is right at the bottom. The bottom here. And she's in there. Right up at the top. So she's folded leaves over and she's made a nice little sack. Now they don't live in there permanently. That's going, that is the egg. That's where she's going to have her eggs. Males don't do that. That is only the female jumping spider. It's only that particular species. Hundreds of different types of jumping spiders. But for this particular one, quite a large brown and white species, quite hairy. And she'll stay in there while she's while the eggs are incubating to protect them. Especially from parasitic wasps. So it's not all year round, it's only now towards the end of the season that you find these things. Preston from Kansas. Morning, Brandy. Do the antelope, wildebeest, and buffalo, and other animals? Do they grow winter coats? I think in some places, Brandy, they they are vastly different climates throughout Africa. Here, where we don't get that cold, I'm not too sure. I don't think so. Maybe they do. Maybe. But I would think that in some places, like the Kalahari or some places up in where, where, where either altitude or topography or other conditions result in uh, in very cold temperatures during the winter months, the dry season. I think there maybe they do, but I really don't know the answer to that, I'm afraid. Whether their coats get thicker or not. Look how dry this is all looking. This is how things should look at the end of April, in fact even in May rather. Everything should still be green into April. Maybe we're hitting the drought this year. We've been very lucky for the last, I don't know, more than a decade. It's been a long time since the drought in this part of the world hit hard. jackal that used to live here. Dina morning, Dina. Dina's in Michigan. Do hyena regurgitate food for their cubs, pups, like dogs? I'm not even sure. Not that I know of, come to think of it. Um, I can't think if I've ever seen hyena at a den regurgitating food. From a young age they'll be taken out to food. Sometimes things are brought back to the den. A 
brought back close to the den. I don't think so. I'll have to look at look in. Hello everyone, being out in Jennifer in Toronto. Very cool. Why well, do I think it's okay to interfere with insects and not other animals? Um, I don't know. I don't know. You mean like turning that beetle over, that one that was on its back? I turned over a tortoise that was on its back, the one that had been chewed by a lioness that one day. That was interfering with the big animal. And I released a dragonfly from a spider's web today, but that's because I wanted to show you what a dragonfly does. How well they're constructed by nature. I still think there's something in here because the squirrel's shouting and the tracks don't come out here. But whatever it is, it's so far in and we're not allowed to go there, so... Let me just go back a little more and see.
is a mamba, black mamba. That is a mamba's main prey. Um, chameleons. Oh shit! Uh huh. Didn't expect to see that, did we? Big box truck. Big box truck. Must have been to the gate and back. Must be doing a delivery. Big box. So, Mamba's main prey. Um, I know that they go with chameleons a lot. And, and what else? Squirrel? Probably. Lizards? Baby birds? Hello, Kukul. What are you skulking for? Other rodents that mumbos might get. I think mumbos are predominantly arboreal. I suppose they do spend a fair amount of time on the ground. Rodents, reptiles, maybe some some birds. We've been looking at rhinoceros beetles of late and I happened to read an article yesterday about rhinoceros beetles becoming a problem on the island of Guam. There's an erratic program affecting palm plantation and other plantations. I've really done a little bit of pressure but been driven over a few times. 
Tamam size vereyim. Bir kestik. Hadi bakalım. Evet. I even brought a special run off this people today. So Guam. 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 How do you pronounce Guam? Yes, that's right. The radio is very quiet this morning. Other vehicles, other lodges, other, other game drive. Compared to yesterday, it was a hub of activity. And one day, there were six different leopards between all the lodges, probably maybe one or two even, one or two more. But that I, six that I know of, there was Kula and Kula. There was Kanyeni and her cub, I think, and then another male that was there with them. And I think Kunyuma. I think who the sixth one was. Morning to BJ in Pennsylvania. BJ is asking about lizards. Apart from the two monitor lizard species that we have, we have the, the Nile monitor, also known as the water monitor. We have the white throat monitor, also known as the rock or tree monitor. BJ wants to know if we have any other large lizards in South Africa. We do indeed. We don't have any other more other other more. We don't have any other monitor lizard species, but we do the next biggest lizards, I suppose, are the plated lizards. The giant plated lizard and the tawny plated lizard, and the rough scale plated lizard, and the yellow throated plated lizard. Although well, the tawny plated and the giant plated lizards tend to mostly only live on rocky areas because they live in rock crevices mountainous areas. Plated lizards are quite habitat specific actually. Uh, we get yellow-throated plated lizards here in the grasslands. We sometimes are lucky enough to see one disappearing in a termite mound and there are also rough scale plated lizards here that might live on termite area. But other than that, in this part of the world, those, those are fairly large lizards are the tree agamas blue-headed tree agama. It's not quite as big as the plated lizards. And then you get very long lizards, the, the, the legless lizards, some of the, the grass lizards that are very, very long. They almost look like snakes. Their tails are sometimes twice the length of their body. Some of them also known as seps, S-E-P-S, seps. Uh, we saw who was it that was eating a plate of lizard the other day? It was a Warburg though. Oh, I can't remember. Who was eating a plate of lizard? Oh, yeah. I think it was a Warburg.
of the reasons why the radio is so quiet is because the repeat is down. The radio repeat. Jones. Morning, wildebeest. I wonder where she's. She should have a calf somewhere. Maybe she's lost her calf. I wonder who these two are. If they're part of our crew. See, she's still lactating, so it should be a calf. And then he, I don't know where he comes from. Maybe that they've been split up from the rest of the herd. Who knows? Push me, pull you. I think that was Dr. Doolittle, the push me, pull you. Joan was saying that there's a reduction in the numbers of monarch butterflies in North America, mostly due to pesticides. Do we have a problem with pesticides in this country? Oh yes, we do. Pesticides and chemical chemical leaks from mines. She's going to lie down again. But I want to go that way, Mrs. Wildebeest. Um, not today. I don't think it's done any damage to our monarch population. Our monarchs in South Africa, or in Africa for that matter, are not migratory, so they don't collect in large numbers. So that you get a I guess that's one of the reasons why you maybe have a population crash in North America, because of the migratory habits of the monarch there. They collect in such big numbers. Sorry, Mr. and Mrs. Want to come past?
so I missed her. Good morning. Gonna rub your horns on the tree for me. That's his, his lick, that's his midden there, part of it at any rate, also an impala midden. Must be a very important spot. If the bird is that part, I wasn't listening to a bird calling, which some people want to know. I still want to go that way, wildebeest. I want to go that way also. Okay. To go there. Okay, I'll go this way. I'll leave you two alone. Buddy, right now, get back to that question. That was wildfires. Do we have wildfires here? And If we do, who we'll fights them and do animals get caught up? Uh, occasionally we do get wildfires. Um, this was an area that was burnt last winter. I don't know whether it was an accidental or an intentional burn. You do get intentional burns. You get areas that are burnt for various ecological reasons. Fires are part of the environment. so. It's I suppose a wildfire is more or less a natural not a natural event. Um, the environment, the habitat, the vegetation, everything learns or learns. I suppose everything is able to, to cope with fire. There are obviously different intensities of fire and obviously at different times of the year fires can do different types of damage. You get very hot fires that can burn. On a hot day, fires that burn with a good wind on a hot day can be very, very hot and they can take out even large trees. I've seen places where fires have, have felled green trees because the, the heat is so intense that it dries out the base of the tree before the fire gets there and then of course it's hot enough for that drier wood then to ignite the crown still green but the trees felled completely burnt at the base. Now you get cool fires, fires that might burn early morning. Um, they can move swiftly enough through the grassland that only the grasses burn. And so because of these different different Results, the different end result from different intensities of fire, different uh, can be used as a tool for different purposes. So sometimes, when you want to get rid of encroaching bush felt, you want a hot fire to to get rid of the encroaching bush. Sometimes, a landowner might just want to get rid of dry moribund grasses that are strangling the new growth from coming through. And invariably, you might find that old felt like that, old grassland like that might have a very high tick load so you might find somebody might want to do a burn for that and of course it's very important what time of the year that happens in terms of intentional burns but the wildfires, fires unintentional, accidental fires that might come into the reserve well uh, normally it's all the guides and, and staff at the lodges that will try and fight these fires if they come through at the wrong time of the year that can be quite detrimental uh, to the environment See if you're using fire as a tool, you can time your fire with the rains and you can make sure that you're not 
really leaving the burnt area for too long before regeneration can occur. And so fires that come out, untimely fires that come out or come through into the reserve from outside the reserve can actually damage the environment. And yes, unfortunately, there are a lot of things that get caught in the fire. You get scavengers that will even move around with the fire. There's certain birds that you can see walking through the, 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 the smoldering ashes. Um, hey, squirrel, got a maroon nut. You want to show us how you open it? Or are you going to bury it? Are you going to hide it in a hole in a tree? You're just going to disappear with it. Who's going to try and eat it? Where are you going with it? Back on the ground, and now I reckon it's probably going to hide it. Pretty cloud. Vast areas like Kruger, when there are fires, uh, there are a lot of animals. Animals, I think, have an instinctive reaction to fire, or are able to react in, 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 instinctively to fire. Not that fast. The On the other hand, there are some reserves that are self-contained reserves, fences all around, relatively small areas, and even maybe something as big as 30,000 hectares, like maybe 70 or thousand acres. Even an area that large can be affected greatly by a fire. So it's far more intensive, far more critical that self-contained areas have proper fire breaks and have proper firefighting equipment. Uh, in fact, most lodges have all got, even here in Kruger, most of the lodges have got firefighting equipment, beaters and bowsers, water bowsers with water pumps to be able to pump water uh, that can be dropped on the back of a pickup or they're already set up on a trailer ready to go at a moment's notice. But self-contained reserves, obviously there's nowhere for animals to go and they can get caught against fences and they can get caught in fire. And we had an incident a few years ago in the Pilansburg National Park. And, well, it is kind of a fenced-in park, but it's as big as it is, and it is very big. Pilansburg is actually this giant volcano crater. And there were a number of elephants that got very badly burned. Nancy, sounds like Nancy 
from Reno, Nevada. If I'm not mistaken. Nancy's asking about also relating to fire. Um, Nancy's asking about the leadwood trees. That when interesting. When there are fires, leadwood trees can burn for months on end. Can I elaborate? Oh, hello, Heron. Sorry, Heron. Heron's having a peaceful day fishing at the dam, and Mark comes along. Some jasmine flowers coming out. I noticed you have some more here. We don't have to get those. We can get some here next to the, the, the weaver's nests. See how brown all the weaver nests are. They've all been they're all finished use being used. And little white flowers of the star jasmine. My flower for the ladies. I can't really see them too well, but... Okay. Head down a track. Past we were headed yesterday. I mean, not yesterday, early this morning. I decided to turn around and we ended up going to have a piece of airstrip. Leadwood trees are probably the densest wood you will find in Africa. I don't think there is any wood that is denser. Uh, it is so dense, so heavy, that it sinks in water. It's very difficult to work with the normal tools. Normally you need specially hardened tools to work with leadwood if you're going to work with it. Leadwood also is very hard to come by because it was used so extensively in the past. And nowadays it's almost illegal, well, it's illegal to collect leadwood in the wild now. But when a leadwood tree stump burns, it can smolder. Because the, the heat is so intense and the wood is so dense that the coals last a very, very long time. But also that it can just keep smoldering, it can just keep burning, sometimes for a couple of months. Not necessarily flame, but just the coals. Just the, the, the wood itself. Smoldering isn't the right word, I suppose hot growing coals. It's hard to explain it. So which way do we go on Weaver's Nest? That way or this way? Maybe that way. Or this way. I can't make up my mind. This way. Sounds like nothing came of those Impala that were racing around, running around on the Impala planes.
morning, Blair, in Vancouver. Nearest town, how close? And do we get mail delivered here or do we have to go to town for mail? Various towns, towns, villages. Towns versus villages. I suppose the nearest town is Shuvukani, which is about 30 kilometers away. No, not that far. 20 kilometers, maybe. Not very much in Shuvukani. I, I used to have a mailbox in Shuvukani at the post office. I used to get mail there. Uh, we don't really get, since we're only here for a short period of time here at Juma, we don't really get mail there. There's nothing really needs to be sent here. So everybody, I suppose, that comes here for the duration of, when it, what, of, of what we're doing, um, we all have our own mailboxes. My mailbox is in good place. Acorn Hook is then the next closest town after Pukulkani. Quite a bad road getting there with a lot of potholes. Are those potholes still bad? Yeah. You can't drive in a straight line. Really shocking how the municipal and government powers that be have let that road so shocking. And it's, it's a main artery to the Sabi Sand. It's also a main. It's a it's a road. It's a, there are many many communities that depend on it. And of course, very poor communities at that. Akonuk is another 30 kilometers after Shivukani and then another 30 kilometers after Akonuk is Footspray, which is about 80 kilometers from here. And Hoodspray, I suppose, Hoodspray and Akonuk are about the same size. My mailbox is now in Hoodspray because I live closer to Hoodspray now because when we were here at Juma that I had a mailbox in Kibokani but I don't really get much in the mail other than bulls and my meds and I mainly have a mailbox so that I can have my chronic meds sent to me speaking of which I've got to try and figure out how I'm going to get them from Hoodspray to here in the next day or two Oh, that's going to work out. Fortunately able to get three months at a time this time around. And we have our food delivered. It comes from Hoodspray, from a supermarket chain in Hoodspray that delivers. Brian does the orders every Monday and we get a delivery every Tuesday. Now, Brian, I'm afraid I have to repeat that. What type of jasmine was Rosalie asking about? Looks like. Confederate Jasmine. I haven't, I haven't any idea what Confederate Jasmine, Jasmine is. I'm assuming it's Jasmine family. The uh, the confusion that can be caused by common names is endless. Uh, we, we we saw it a little while ago. I was asked about resurrection plant, and it turns out there are like three, four different types of resurrection plant, none of which are related, all of which look completely different to each other. Uh, 
and turns out the one that was being spoken of was this one particular ancient almost moss type plant but we found that there's a resurrection plant in South Africa that's nothing like that it's actually just a normal flower and there's the resurrection lilies that came out of that which are almost like our March lilies um, common names it's impossible to compare plants based on common names alone it's, it, it's one of the reasons why botanical names or scientific names are so important in in the world or in my world because there can be no mistake when we speak of botanical names if everything is given two names their genus and their species name so what i'm guessing is that maybe your confederate jasmine might be the same family as our jasmine and it might even be the same genus as our jasmine but it might and is most likely a different species of jasmine so that need i need to go and have a reminder in my book this jasmine is known as jasminium jasminium Hitting on low. We get a few types of jasmine here. This is the jasmine people, star jasmine. I think it's got about a seven petal jasmine. Genevieve. The adrenaline rush in animals, does it vary between males and females, or is this the self-preservation instinct so strong it doesn't really matter? I don't even know how to begin to answer that one, Jennifer. I can't imagine. I suppose I can imagine that male and female act somewhat differently. I can't imagine that we react differently. Uh, I can't imagine that uh, I really did. How would one measure that? That is an interesting concept.
but we, we're talking adrenaline rushes, obviously speaking of the moment they're being chased or from that moment that predator begins the hunt and, and they're alarming and they're running away and that, that, that adrenaline rush. Uh, and it never, uh, it never occurred to me to think of, of, of how that adrenaline rush, how that adrenaline rush is related to that need to get away or that need, that self-preservation instinct, that, that need to, to survive. And whether it is, uh, are we speaking of in the clutches and the jaws of the predator or just running away? Uh, I, I'm a little bit not quite sure, not quite sure what you mean there, but there is an adrenaline rush, there is a spark, and of course it's all that adrenaline that, that, that dulls the pain when something is happening, when something extremely traumatic is happening. be able to, to measure the very the difference between males and females and, and, and I don't know how one would do that. Sorry. Backwards forward, backwards forward, backwards left. Yes, the tree. get into the drainage line from here. Let's see if we can find some sign of that cat. Morning Jackie, Pittsburgh. Do we have plants similar to poison ivy? Uh oh, there's a spider. Mm, there is a plant here, not as bad as poison ivy. In the summer months, you do get a small plant that has a leaf that stings but doesn't last for very long. anything as bad as poison ivy or poison oak here yeah, in this and I remember in East Africa there was a plant on Mafia Island I was chasing after a Zanja elephant root not chasing after it but I was trying to get a view of it it was the first time I'd ever seen it one of the incredible, incredible new animals to, for me to see and I was trying to get a look at it and being a tropical island paradise I was just in a pair of shorts, barefoot, no shirt, and walked through not knowing because there were a lot of plants on the island I didn't know about. So not knowing what it was, I just walked straight through it and of course I got it all over my body. I don't know how to, it would compare with poison ivy. It seems like the elephants have been here, been very busy in the riverbed. Yeah, kitty, kitty. Where did you go? 
okay. of a dove killed by something all that remains feathers hello Mr. Kudu two bulls Okay, not great view of Kudu. I'm going to carry on. Continue. Find an elephant. If we can. Or something. These elephants seem to have all gone. By the way. Elephants are so, so social. Do they have any particular mating ritual or dance? Um, who is that from Brenda? Not really, no. Um, See, I suppose there has to be a fair amount of sweet talking by the bull, but what happens is when the female is in Easter, whether it's the matriarch or one of the cows within her herd, um, there are obviously telltale signs. There are hormones and scents that are picked up in the urine of the bull, and I suppose as well as in temporal secretions that might occur. Um, signs that tell bulls they're female in East just they'll pick that up. And so they will then I suppose communicate verbally, vocally with the, 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 the females, especially the matriarch. And in the process get closer to her and them and then it's up to the matriarch whether she allows the bull to come in and mate or not. I suppose the most, the closest we can get to uh, a ritual as it were is the laying of the trunk of the bull along the spine of the cow before he mounts her to subdue her or to calm her or to caress her or to Older. But there isn't really a, a special mating ritual, other than I guess a lot of symbolizing and a 
an interaction with the and stuff. See it well. Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. Elephant. Good. <laughs> uh, they're all heading down to the riverbed. Hello, Ellie's. Maybe we can get in there. Maybe we'll see who's here first. Here's a youngster. Good morning, children. All of those footprints in the dry river bed, I think this is the herd that's been there. But if we can only just get to see them, let's see if we go a little further. There might be a track that takes us down to the riverbed. They're slowly making their way along thicket. This is all the riparian thicket on the edge of the Mawati River that leads up to Gari Dam. So my guess is that eventually they're all going to end up there later this morning. I think it's a little bit far away and they're moving rather slowly to hope that they're going to get there anytime soon. this track and try and get down into the riverbed but I don't know Buffalo, or are you sleeping? No, he's sleeping. You can see an ear moving. Interesting to see if the elephants come along. I wonder if he is stuck. I don't think these are as deep as. I think he's probably just lying down. Places like this that I've seen in East Africa that get very deep, you can get an elephant stuck up to its 
shoulders and then there's no getting out and there's no way of getting anything in there oh by the way just quickly the squirrels look at chewing on a what is he eating there maroon nut it's chewing the fruit off first to get to the stone it'd be nice if we can have the ellies come this way You can almost hear that squirrel going yum 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 Let's go back a little bit. Morning, Mr. Buff. It'd be really nice to see if you could move a little bit. So there's nothing I'm going to be able to do. What you doing now, squirrel? Found another one. Okay, let's try and get down into the river. If we can find Nelly. See, do we get down there next to that jackalberry, maybe? I don't think so. I think it's further back. That little squirrel.
remember the Majingilan sleeping here one day. Tara and I watching them. We'll have to come back and have a look at his wallow later or... Brenda, following up on elephant mating, what happens if a matriarch and another female is any good and they both need to be covered and um, does the matriarch have to say, really sure Brenda, it's, uh, I think As I say, hold off younger bulls for a number of older bulls. See, I wonder if we can get through this Tambuti. Um, maybe that side. But try not to touch the leaves too much. Because if they break it, get a be latex that's poisonous. Because you get the milk on your hand and now you want to so if you eat anything you're gonna get the runs. If you eat anything your hand then um, you can find the earliest down this way. If there are two females in estrus, the same arm, which can happen, does happen. I'm not really sure how the matriarch deals with that, but to be honest. I guess things happen differently at different times, depending on how many bulls are around, whether they are suitors, whether they are eligible bulls for mating. Maybe only one bull is allowed in and mates with both of them. Um, Really not sure, I'm afraid. This should be here somewhere nearby. Sedge grass. Okay. Don't think we're gonna get to see them from here. can hear them. Hooded kingfisher straight ahead. It's gone.
holes here being dug by elephants or set for water. I'm trying to avoid them because I might get a bit deep for the wheels. I don't know, these alias tucked in this bush between here and Twin Dams Road. An elephant path over here. We've either got to get ourselves. Oh, there's a marabou stalk. Haven't seen one of those in a long time. See, it's going to come over this way, maybe. Oh, come on! Don't turn there. Biggest, heaviest stalks. What is he doing, Marabou? Morning, girl. That is what we don't want. Uh oh. And once again, come on to this side as much as you can. Like, like we're in a yacht. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to have to maybe just try and. You're going to have to get off. Yeah. Uh, but I'm gonna see if I can't maybe just shoot forward okay you want to get off because it's gonna bounce probably that is a big hole No, we didn't. No, I don't think that was where we got stuck. We got stuck in that that one dead end spot where there's... We didn't get stuck, we got waylaid. I don't know how we got out of there. Yeah. With this one? Yeah. Just had to use momentum. But that was an exceptionally deep hole. Um, We might have to get a helicopter in to get us out of here now. Oh, I'll find my way around that hole. I'll have to find my way around that hole somehow. a bit of excitement every now and then.
I'll show everybody that. I don't know if you can't really see it from here, but that's the hole that the front left went into. And we had to... And we're lucky we have the articulation and short wheelbase of this vehicle to be able to get out of that one. Because there was no going backwards. Absolutely no getting it out of the hole backwards. It was one of those things that it's forward and nothing. Maybe we can get back down there now and head back towards those elephants. I don't know if you can really see from from the camera way the vehicle. I don't think you can really tell sometimes how steep it is we climb up or go down or but it can be quite nerve-wracking sometimes. But fortunately knowing the capabilities of the vehicle. Sticking to the one basic rule of four-wheel drive operation, as slow as possible, as fast as necessary, a sapper fan. Okay, somewhere here. I think. We didn't go, come down too far down the riverbed. We only went about a hundred yards or so after we saw them to come into the riverbed. Most of them looked like they were coming to the riverbed. There isn't much of a gap between here and the road, but it is very, very dense vegetation. Could be the Ellies are just stuck in there feeding. A lot of animals, I think, because of the temperature change, time for changing conditions, one of the reasons. Hello, everyone. Being out in the bush and being. Things. Very large. It's often very difficult to, to hear. And here is be a hole that I can't see. Like that one. There's an elephant coming into the riverbed now, in front of us. Sorry, you are. Right? Yeah, I'm good. I'm probably. Sitting on a horse that the bus suddenly stopped. So the 
alleys must have moved a little bit further north out of the river on the bank and now they're starting to cross almost exactly where we came in. So I suppose if we'd stayed with that buffalo and the wallow we would have seen them. There's a little one coming into the river now. Another little one. Let's just stop and watch them. <laughs> Two little ones now, Mom. Can't get up here, that's for sure. We we'll have to carry on. I think it might be the one glimpse that we get again. There she goes, heading up towards Mamba Road, maybe. Maybe let's try this little angle instead of going through the branches. I'm on the bank. Morning, children. Where's your mother? Playing those children. Nice little open area there. If I could only get through to there. A 
having a shoving match. Nice if I can get to see them a bit better. One of the cars still in the bush. I don't want to go. I think the bigger one is being a little bit soft on this little one. Playtime for elephants. Mind the eye. Cheeky little thing. And move past his wattle. Crunch. They're all going into rather right, thick bush again. Low sickle bush. Beautiful big dead lead woods. Uh, there's a bigger elephant now come up to come to break up this little play fight. Spoil sport. Can elephants bite each other? Tammy? They can, actually. The trunks and tails, and maybe ears. They're known to bite each other, yes. Pretty most of the fun is happening behind the trees. I wish I could just get into the little open grassland patch where they are.
Okay, copy. Do you think they can have a look at the game drive radio that's in Jigger? It is out of the... it's, it's disconnected. Okay, well, as they all move off, so are we going to have to find our way back to reality. That's the point. Back to roads and camps and things. I was hoping that the guys could have trees up there with Jigger um, and do it in time. Okay, once again, this is going to only take a try or two. after the land cruisers had damaged that crossing a while ago that maybe it wouldn't be so easy. Fox is a landy. Right, just gonna pop in and see this buffalo. The elephant would have come past the mud waller where the buffalo has been. Looks like it might have gone. No, he's here. He's moved, turned around. I think he's fine. He's just lying down. If he's lying, see if he was standing up, we'd be a different story. So it's probably that he got up when the elephants came by and then moved because he thought they might have wanted something in the wallow. But he's lying down, so he's out of there. He's nothing wrong with him. If he's if he was standing up and his legs, then it might have been a different story. But that these these little mud wallows we have are never that deep that animals get stuck in them. It's some places where there are thousands of elephants and buffaloes and things, and you get these clay patches that are in some of the major rivers when the rivers start drying up in the dry season. Those the, the river initially was so deep and the clay layer is so thick that, as I said, you know, even an adult elephant can find themselves stuck in those clay pits. And there's no getting an elephant out of the clay like that. Not in the middle of wilderness areas where you can't even get vehicles. Where I've seen things when I've been on foot because I'm not walking so far. 
any access and unfortunately they die sometimes in an elephant stuck that has been in the throes of death I've, I've only ever experienced elephant carcasses and dead elephants but it would be heartbreaking an elephant stuck in the mud or I suppose even a buffalo often buffalo stuck in the mud and there's not much one can do you gotta think about it, try and put a rope on the animal and try and pull it out. You can, you can, you can probably accomplish that. Then what you've got is you've got to read the animal. When I say mad, I mean angry. The animal will look around its horns or somewhere around its body. How then do you get the rope from the animal? Um, and yeah, they're a lion. In the rivers, crocodiles even, they come and feed on the carcasses. So a little bit of excitement at the end of our raft. Hope you enjoyed your evening, afternoon, wherever you are. Our wonderful blue and green place. Thanks for joining us. My name is Mark Andrews, the camera. I think we might have a different presenter this afternoon. I think maybe Scott might be out. We'll see if we can get up and running. Other as I say, and, uh, from all from all of us. Love you lots. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. We'll just maybe get a minute to see. Oh, I don't we'll get to the dam in time. Like it's promising for elephant this afternoon, weather with a little bit of elephant. Looks like we missed some at the dam this morning. Okay, Brian, just if you can 